we're going to die. We're all going to die. It is not something that young people understand very easily. Some of us who are older understand a little better that we are going to die. And most of us are afraid when we think about the whole notion of dying, of not being here anymore. But I'm here to tell you, as the people of God, there is no need to fear death because we know someone who has conquered death. Amen. We know someone who is bigger than death, and death is but only asleep. Nevertheless, follow me closely as I point out to you today that the wise man saying, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible suggests that the word whatever in this text comes from a Hebrew word translated everything, all, or anything. And the word might comes from a Hebrew word translated strength, power, ability, produce wealth, human strength, the strength of angels, the power of God. Carson, another Old Testament scholar, offers that the text is referring to what is available within one's ability. That life is to be effective, operational, vigorous, energetic, functional, and dynamic. This, of course, is the opposite of death. Since in that condition, there are no opportunities left to make good on anything in this world. Once dead, nothing can be reversed. We cannot hug. We cannot kiss. We cannot snuggle. We cannot affirm. We cannot compliment. We cannot love. We cannot forgive. We cannot marry. We cannot share a meal at sunset, a next game, or a concert with another. We cannot go on mission trips overseas. It is too late. Funds cannot be saved, visas cannot be obtained, planes cannot be boarded, people cannot travel. We can no longer be faithful in our tithes and offerings. We cannot even support the president's vision for this conference. When you're dead, it's over. Nothing can be done. All we have, brothers and sisters, is this life right now, today, to give it our all, to do all we can in our relationships to give honor and glory to God. Many times in life, in our families, we think, I'll do it tomorrow. Your wife wants you to do something today, but you'll put her off. Your husband needs something from you today, but you'll put him off. Your children need you today, but we've got next week. We've got tomorrow, and I'm here today to say to you, all we have is today, right now, right here, and we need to do all that we can. Ecclesiastes. It's a notorious, perhaps the world's most legendary eyewitness to the reality of pointlessness. The sharp, biting, stinging humor employed in its narratives get our attention. The keeping it real expressions force us to take notice of the substance that affects our lives every day. We cannot escape its truisms. It is the kind of bits and pieces that compels us to sit up and take notice. Christians and not Christians take notice. Women and men pay attention. Blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians, and Indians pay attention. Rich and poor pay attention. Democrats, Republicans, and Independents pay attention. And many of them are surprised, stunned, shaken, and shocked to find this kind of analysis, this kind of calculation, this kind of logic and reasoning in the Word of God. It is our pension for going off on our own and trying to live our lives based on our own opinions and desires that makes the book of Ecclesiastes required reading. Amen. Ecclesiastes. It is a John the Baptist kind of book. It functions not as a meal, but as a bath. It is not nourishment. It is cleansing. It is repentance. It is purging. We read Ecclesiastes to get scrubbed clean from illusions, from ideas that are idolatrous, and feelings that get in the way. 
Ecclesiastes is a rebuffing and rejection of every big-headed, conceited, egotistical, and overconfident notion that we can live our lives in relationships by ourselves, based on our own opinions and desires, and on our own terms. When the wise man proposes that we do all we can, in our pursuit of healthy relationships as fathers, as mothers, as husbands and wives, as grandfathers and grandmothers, as sons and daughters, as boyfriends and girlfriends, as single adults and teenagers, he is saying that this life is the only chance we have to make good. And after the death and judgment, there's nothing else for us to do but to receive a reward. There are three things I'd like to share with you that come out of my study of what the wise man is saying. Three things that we can apply to family relationships. Number one, we need to be committed to preserving and protecting our relationship. We need to be committed to preserving and protecting our relationships. The world wants to destroy us. Satan wants to destroy us. When we have strong marriages in the church, we're more likely to have strong families in the church. When we have strong families in the church, the discipleship of children is more likely to happen. Faithful stewardship is more likely to be practiced. A strong witness is more likely to be had, a strong church is more likely to exist. Then we can preach the gospel with power and joy and grace and help to hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. Satan knows this. Satan knows that if he can destroy the family, he's destroyed the fiber, the fundamental principles of the church. Satan knows that without marriage, without the family, there is very little to hold us up, to hold us on to important values. Be committed to preserving and protecting your relationships. Turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And here's what the Word of God has to say. Two are better than one. Because, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, I want you to know that I have a 30-minute dissertation on these verses, but I won't share them with you this morning. I want you to take the time and go home and study them, but I'll say this much about this. It is a characteristic Jewish writing. Uh, Jewish writers work, wrote with chiasms, with structures. Here we go. If you begin in the verses before the ones that I read, it begins with one, a man who was all by himself, uh, and, and he wasn't doing very much, and he wasn't enjoying himself. And then the Bible goes on to say, the writer of Ecclesiastes goes on to say, two are better than one. And goes on to give us a litany of why two are better than one. If you're working and you're getting a job done and you have two people doing it, instead of just one, you can do the job better. You can do the job faster. You can get it done more easily. Two are better than one in a bed. If you are lying down and you're by yourself, you are apt. You, you might get cold. But if two are under a blanket, the Bible says, we will stay warm. Two are better than one. If one falls down, it can help the other one up. Two are better than one. This is entirely the structure of God's universe. God is all about relationships. That's why he gave us marriage. Two are better than one. And then it ends with three. And the third person in this triad is Jesus Christ. A strand of three cords cannot be easily broken. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that marriage will never work unless Jesus Christ is in the middle of it. 
husband and wife need to be committed to Jesus, and Jesus, who's already committed to us, needs to be welcomed into our homes every day. Social science tells us that married people 